Space Patrol! High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol! Commander Corey and Cadet Happy are at the Lunar Fleet Base on the Earth's moon. Just inside the north rim of the huge atmosphere shell is a large hangar, entirely surrounded by a high fence of endurium mesh. A command car halts at the gate. An armed guard examines the credentials of the three men in the car, then salutes. The car pulls through the gate and heads toward the hangar. Behind its giant door lies one of the most costly and carefully guarded secrets that Space Patrol scientists have ever undertaken. Uh, stop the car at this end of the hangar, if you will, Cadet. Yes, sir. Hey, isn't anyone working around here today? Outside of the guard, I mean? No, Hap. It's United Planets Day, remember? Oh, sure. A holiday. That's why I suggested that today be ideal for a final inspection of the ship before the official test. So, uh, ready, Mr. Meyer, huh? If, uh, if you don't mind, Commander, before I open that hangar door, I'd... I'd like to collect my thoughts. Of course. It's been three years. Three years of almost constant work. You've had a tremendous responsibility, that's certain. Yes, but it must have been exciting. Building a spaceship with a super-sensitive star drive. A ship that can go anywhere in the galaxy. All right, Cadet. I know you're anxious to see it. I'll open the hangar door. Commander, are we going to be aboard tomorrow on the test flight? Not in the first one, Hap. Tomorrow, Hap's assistant, Bradley and Scott, will be the only ones aboard. Oh. Secretary General's orders, Hap. For some reason, he doesn't want us to run the risk of disappearing into another dimension. I need some help with that door, Mr. Meyerhoff. Oh, well, I have it in a minute. These electronic locks always give me trouble. Hey, look. Why? Why, it's impossible. The hangar is empty. The ship is gone. Into the command car, quick. We're going to base headquarters. A few moments later, at headquarters of the Lunar Fleet Base, Commander Corey questions a thoroughly bewildered guard, then sends Happy to communications to space a phone and all planets alert. As the last guard salutes and strides out the door, Buzz turns to Meyerhoff, who's been sitting motionless, staring into space. The guards say nobody entered the gate. Space control is accounted for every ship that passes the space locks. Mr. I know this is a blow to you, but you're the only one who can help us. Yes. Who besides yourself knows the combination of that electronic lock? Just Bradley and Scott. The guards say nobody came through the gate. Besides, that ship couldn't have been removed from the hangar without tearing down that fence. And it couldn't blast off in the fleet base without going through the space locks. Or could it? This star drive, it operates through a different space-time matrix, doesn't it? Now tell me this. Could that ship be put into another dimension from a dead standstill? I... Uh, I... Don't know. It would be risky to try. Could it have been an accident? Could that hypermagnetic star drive mechanism have cut in by itself? Really, I I can't say. Well, the all planet alert is going out, sir. Oh, thanks, Hap. The ship would be halfway to Alpha Centauri by this time. Anything in Mr. Meyerhoff's assistance? No, sir. The base has been searched and there's no sign of either Bradley or Scott. Mm. The guards insist that nobody went through that gate. Anything for Terra headquarters, Hans? Just routine, sir. Except that Professor Nicholson has disappeared. Arthur Nicholson, the bacteriologist? Yes, sir. And Major Robertson has assigned two agents to handle the case. Well, we'll rob you on the job. We won't have to worry about that. Uh, Mr. Meyerhoff, about this star drive, can you tell me if... Commander, I, I don't know what happened. I can't explain it. Oh, we're all in the dark, Meyerhoff. The Bradley and Scott gone, you're the only man in the solar system who can even make an intelligent guess about what happened to the star drive. I'm sorry. But I don't know how it works. What? You don't? It wasn't actually my theory. I followed someone else's blueprint, so to speak. That's why I've been so worried. Well, who did originate the theory? A man named Jano Kalmir. He came to me three years ago and asked me to work with him. I was to take all the credits and supervise the actual construction. Where is this Jano Kalmir now? He's in a criminal rehabilitation center on Mars. Well, that means he's in suspended animation. Oh, yes, I remember the name. Kalmir was convicted of fraud and bribery of public officials. 
seem to have an amazing power of persuasion and credible influence over people. I can testify to that. He's utterly compelling. Even after he was arrested, I continued his work, just as though he were still beside me. At Space the Mars Rehab Center and find out what stage of treatment Cal Mir is in. If he's not under suspended animation, he can probably help us. Yes, sir. Well, Happy's contacting Mars, my heart. Suppose you tell me what you know about Jano Cal Mir. Commander, I've made contact with Mars Rehab Center. It's Dr. Wallace, the assistant superintendent. Oh, thanks, Happy. Dr. Wallace? Yes, Commander. I'd like to know what stage of treatment one of your patients is in at the present time. The chart is right in front of me, Commander. Patient's name, please? Jano Calmere. Commander, Jano Calmere disappeared. Disappeared? How? Sometime during the night. You see, he'd completed all the phases of treatment and was in the outpatient section for general observation. When he didn't show up for breakfast, we got a little worried. Has his escape been reported to Space Patrol? Escape? Why, no one would escape when they're cured of criminal tendencies and about to be released. Calmer has been reported missing, however, and a search has uh, been... Dr. Wallace, issue an emergency alert immediately. General Calmer is not a missing patient. He's an escaped criminal. Corey, out. Well, the rocket first the ship disappears, and Bradley, and Scott, and now Calmer. Well, as the doctor said, it is incredible that a cured patient would escape. It's also incredible that a spaceship should vanish from a locked and guarded hangar. Meyerhoff, get your gear ready. I'm issuing an all-planets alert for General Calmy, and then we're blasting off for Mars. I've recomputed our vector, sir. We'll cut rockets on Mars at about 1409 hours. I'd like to increase our acceleration, but I don't think Meyerhoff could take it. I'm afraid you're right, Commander. This literally is just about my speed. Meyerhoff, I... Thought you were back aft taking a nap. Oh, I'm too keyed out to sleep. Excuse me, sir. Moving object in the viewscope. 14 degree heading off starboard. Relative velocity 55,000 DUs. Not quite a collision course. Not a meteor, is it? Can't tell for sure just yet. No. No, it's decelerating. And changing vector slightly. The spaceship. And the pilot undoubtedly sees it. From here, it looks like a freighter. Yes, sir. That blunt nose would make it a class D, probably. The way she's acting, she must be in trouble. We'll cut our velocity and hail her. Well, that's all we need now is to have to stop and play nurse to a limping old space bucket. What do you suppose is wrong? Could be anything from a faulty air purifier to a shortage of fuel. Or maybe the pilot just wants to borrow my comb. Or are you... Oh, you're joking. <laughs> well, it's hard to tell what is a joke these days. While you were back aft, the commander and I heard about a brand new kind of crime over the space phone. Some goofy crook is stealing mud. Mud? Plain old Venus mud. Well, it wasn't exactly plain mud. It was a specially treated topsoil on an experimental farm. During the night, about 10,000 cubic feet of the stuff was either scooped or sucked up by a vacuum pump into a spaceship. The whole cargo wouldn't be worth 10 credits. Imagine going to all that trouble and expense to seal mud <laughs> when it would be cheaper to make your own. Hey, hey, look at that freighter. It's sure a battered up old hulk. And it's the Jupiter Registry. Let's see what his trouble is. Commander Corey aboard Terra 5 calling Class B freighter number JF-369. Acknowledged by space, a phone, or signal light. Freighter JF-369 to Commander Corey. Emergency. A small meteor punctured the hull and I can't plug it. Why, that... Uh, that's terrible. How many are aboard? Just myself. I don't have a space suit or I wouldn't have troubled you. Stand by to join airlocks. We're in a hurry, so we'll bring you a space suit. Thanks. I'll get the suit out of the locker, Commander. That'll leave you and the cadet free to maneuver the ship. Thanks, my arm. All right, have to stand by to apply my gunny coupler. Standing by, sir. But, Commander, the freighter blew up. That's no explosion. The hull is peeling off in sections. That, that's a false hull. You must be shedding it with a repeller ray. That's right. Just clearing the deck so we can join airlocks, Commander. Smoke and rockets. Look what's underneath. What a ship. It's a star drive. So he wants to join airlocks. Fine, we'll hold him fast with our magnetic copper, then board him and give him a fight if he wants it. Great. I... Hey, Commander, my ray gun's gone. And so is yours. I've got them, gentlemen. Now you will do as Calmer tells you. Bring them aboard the star drive, Meyerhoff. Commander, you're coming with me to Valcor, 50 light years away. And you're never coming back. <laughs> secret spaceship with the new star drive disappears mysteriously from the lunar fleet base, Buzz and Happy learn that the actual inventor, Jano Kalmir, has escaped from a criminal rehabilitation center on the planet Mars. 
the space patrollers blast off for the Red Planet, taking with them a Mr. Meyerhoff, the scientist who directed the construction of the interstellar craft. They stop to aid a battered freighter, which suddenly sheds its false hull, revealing the sleek lines of the missing star drive ship. Double-crossed by the supposedly honest passenger, Buzz and Happy now stand in the control compartment of a super-speed ship held at gunpoint by Meyer Hoffman Calmere. It's good to have you aboard, Corey. I never thought I'd have quite so many distinguished and useful passengers aboard. You'll be quite welcome on Valcor. Just where and what is Valcor? The main planet of the star Garzek, 50 light years from the solar system. Meyerhoff, I'll watch Corey and the cadet. You release the magnetic coupler and blast away from the Terra 5. Yes, Galvar. Double crosser. You're being unfair to Meyerhoff, cadet. He can't help cooperating with me. By now, it's almost an instinctive reaction. And all the time Meyerhoff was building the star drive ship, he knew you were going to steal it. No, he acted in good faith. His only conscious goal was to follow my designs and build a ship that could reach the stars. I believe Corey's ship, Calmer. Good. Increase acceleration. When we're far out of the solar system, we'll cut into star drives. What makes you think there are any planets circling the star, Dozek? And this Valcor, how do you know it can support life even if it exists? Because, Commander, Valcor is my home planet. I don't believe it. I am a Valcorian. I have mental powers far higher than anyone in your solar system. I can persuade and influence you lesser beings. The result? You employ your own intelligence and energy to achieve my goals. Yet you think you are working through your own free will. I can tell you now that you won't get any cooperation from Happy and me. No, that's true. That's because our first meeting was on a level of force and conflict. If you Valcorians are so superior, why are you taking us with you? Why do you need us? That's something you will learn later. Originally, I had planned to take only Meyerhoff and Nicholson, the bacteriologist. Nicholson? You mean he's aboard the star drive? Yes. In suspended animation. His work will begin after we reach Valcor. What work? Valcor is suffering from a shortage of nitrogen-fixing bacteria. Plant life doesn't grow as it should. Consequently, we are faced with an eventual food shortage. That's the chief reason I came to your solar system, to find beneficial bacteria. And I suppose you were successful? Yes. I found the type I was looking for on the planet Venus. I scooped up several thousand cubic feet of mud containing the bacteria from one of your experimental farms. And you abducted Professor Nicholson to develop that strain of bacteria. Correct. As a scientist, he should be quite happy on Valcor. How did you get the star drive ship off the lunar fleet base? Meyerhoff's assistants Bradley and Scott were able to deceive the guards, thanks to my influence on their minds. They put the star drive directly into a higher dimension. And the ship rematerialized somewhere else. Yes, out beyond the Neptune orbit. Where are Bradley and Scott now? Aboard this ship? No, they're in a hospital on Venus. You see, going directly into the star drive has a disturbing effect upon the mind. But don't worry, they'll recover. Tell me, look at the view scope. Huh? Spaceships. Commander, they're approaching from all directions. Those are space patrol ships, Calmia. You're surrounded. Meyerhoff, what is our velocity? It's uh, 80,000 DU. We'll go into star drive. But we're only traveling a small fraction of the speed of light. We're far under the safety margin. Remember what happened to Bradley and Scott. But they were on the surface of the Earth's moon, under a strong gravity pull. We are out in space. What difference does that make? Out here, away from a large mass, we're under less resistance. When we're suddenly transformed into another dimension, we'll black out, but it won't be serious. Go on, Meyerhoff. Cut in the star drive. All right, tell me. Nothing's happening. Just wait. In a few seconds, we'll vanish from the view of those ships. Rush him, Hap. Yes, sir. <laughs> You're too late. When you come to, we'll be in another galaxy. Under the force of the star drive, the spaceship is in a dimension where time and space as we know it have no meaning. The four men lie motionless on the deck of the control compartment. Buzz and Happy are the first to regain consciousness. The ship is completely silent now, and through the viewport, not a single star relieves the blackness of space. Gently, Buzz nudges Happy. Happy. Calmly and Meyerhoff are still out. Now's our chance. We'll grab their ray guns and wait for them to come. Hurry. They're coming around. <laughs> I've got Meyerhoff's guns. Sir. Keep an eye on them. I'll take care of Calmly. Let's go with the gun, Calmia. 
Now get to the controls and get us back to the solar system. That's impossible, Commander. Once the star drive is set, it cannot be changed until the ship reaches its predetermined destination. When we are near Valcor, the ship automatically will cut out a star drive into regular rocket drive. Commander, maybe something's wrong with the ship. Everything's so quiet. The star drive makes no sound, except when it cuts in or out. How long will it take us to reach Valcor? In star drive, Commander, that is a meaningless question. To you, it may seem a month or a year. To me, it may appear to be a minute or two. It doesn't matter anyway. You might as well resign yourself to the fact that you will spend the rest of your lives on Valcor. Yeah? Well, I'm not... Go- What's that? We're cutting out of the star drive. That means we're near Valcor. Prepare to blackout. This time, when Buzz and Happy open their eyes, the ship is again silent. But a bright light is pouring in through the viewports. And standing over them with a ray gun is Kalmir. On your feet, gentlemen. And I hope you both realize the utility of forcing me to use this weapon. So you pulled out of it first this time, Kalmir? Yes. Possibly the excitement of my return to Valcor revived me so quickly. I don't hear the rockets. And where's that light coming from? The light is from Garzek, the star that is Valcor's sun. And you don't hear the rockets because the ship has landed. You mean you came out of the star drive right onto Valcor? No, we emerged from hyperspace several million DUs from the planet. Meyerhoff and I brought the ship in. The Meyerhoff's okay now, huh? Yes, he's back at checking on Professor Nicholson. Dargo calling Kalmir. I'll relieve you of the two spacemen. Bring them to the edge of the clearing. Dargo out. Hey, who was that? A Valcorian, of course. A friend of mine. But he was speaking English. Dargo is a scholar. He knows the languages of many universes. Just a minute. How does it happen that he contacts you in English? Why not Valkorian? By looking through the viewport, I can see we're landed out in the wilderness. There's no sign of a city. Yeah, Kelmer, how come? I thought you had such an advanced civilization. This is of no importance. Come, Dargo is waiting. I did as you told me, Kelmer. Good. Nicholson will come out of suspended animation in about an hour. Meyerhoff, stay here in the ship. I'll be right back. Very well. Go on, Corey. You too, cadet. Kalmir, what are you going to do with them? Turn them over to Dargo. And why do you want it all? Oh, it's none of my business, sorry. Gentlemen, you are the first human beings from your universe to set foot on Valcor. That fellow coming toward us, that's Dargo? Yes. Well, you were right, Commander. There's no sign of the city. Come here. You've come back with a cargo of valuable nitrogen-fixing bacteria. And with a scientist who can show you how to use it. You should be landing at your planet's capital with bands playing and people cheering. We don't go in for such childish displays on Valcor. No. Perhaps you and Dargo are criminals on your own planet. That is not true. But explain why Dargo contacted you in English. So no one on Valcor could understand your conversation. Dargo will explain when he is ready. He'll take over now. Dargo. Here are the spacemen from the solar system. Fine specimen. Chef Kalo Tazan Abgida. Rumoina Corvey. Van. Aknola Ru Chrisoma. Blan Zultron. Kalmir has just explained that you think we are criminals. Actually, we are patriots fighting against an evil leader. We need your help. I don't like your recruiting methods, Dargo. Commander, there are two factions here on Valcor. The one in power promised to help the people by finding new sources of food. They lied. The rulers are confiscating supplies for their own selfish needs. If that's true, I'm sorry to hear it. So far, your methods don't seem very democratic to me. Yeah. How do we know the people would be any better off if your game took over? That is not your concern. You are here on Valcor. You can't return to your home planet. So you have to work for us. What could we do? We don't know your language or, or anything about your planet. But you do know how to fight. You could help organize an army. You could set up a counter spy system. You could, you could give me that ray gun. I'll get Dargo. Drop it, Kalmir. You fool. My men are back there in the forest. You're not going to get a chance to warn them. Come on, half get back to the ship quick. Yes, sir. Hey, what about Meyerhoff? If he saw you what happened... You don't take a chance of Meyerhoff or stay here forever. I'll go first, Hat. When you're aboard, slam the hatch closed. All right, Meyerhoff. Get your hands up and get away from those controls. Yes, Commander. 
Okay, Commander. Well, that rocket drive controls are different on this ship. I'll help you, Commander. I thought you were working for Calmere. Well, I don't know what came over me. I must have been out of my mind. Hey, Commander, Calmere and his pal are running toward the ship, and Dargo is aiming something at us. All right, Myron. If you're on the level, get this ship off the ground in a hurry. I'm a little confused. I think this is... This is the rocket control here. No, no, that's the repeller ray. Leave it on. We're off the ground. Get all the altitude you can with the repeller ray, then blast off. Dargo is still aiming that thing at us, for whatever it is. If he shoots the ship down now, he won't stand a chance. Does the ship have any weapons, any space torpedoes? No, it's unarmed. Oh, wait, Meyerhoff. Where's the cargo hatch release? The cargo hatch release? Yes, where the mud is stored. Oh, yes. Uh, just press the switch and the hatch will open. I'm going to shift toward the starboard. The repeller ray control. Tell me when we're right over Dargo. Hey, great. They will dare shoot the ship down when it'll fall on them. We're nearly over them, sir. Bombs away. Hey, a direct hit. Look at them down there, covered with tons of nice, gooey mud. Didn't bury them, did it? Oh, no, sir. It's spreading out. But they're sure wallowing around. Oh, I've got it now, Commander. This is the rocket control. Brace yourselves. I'm going to fire rockets. <laughs> Goodbye, Valcor. Well, the question now is whether we can find the solar system. Firehawk, do you know how to set up the star drive for the return trip? Well, yes. You simply use the reciprocals of the hyperspace coordinates that we used to get to Valcor. Well, I'm sure glad you're back on our side. I figured that Calmere's influence over Meyerhoff was broken right after we landed. Probably it was the shock of going in and out of the star drive. Well, this time we'll wait till we reach peak velocity with your rocket drive before we switch over. Have you and I better go back and see if Professor Nicholson is all right? Yes, sir. Well, I wonder if Calmere and Dargo are still floundering around in the mud. Boy, I'll bet they're mad. I should be grateful to her for the favor. Favor? Yes. Dargo needed soil containing nitrogen fixing bacteria. And that's what they got. Yeah, that's right. We dumped it right in their laps. <laughs> again next week for another thrilling adventure with Space Patrol! High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Missions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol! Mike Moser production starring Ed Kimmer as Commander Corey and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy was written by Lou.